Greetings YouTube. Today I'm going to review the latest non-fiction book I've read, Stephen Pinker's The Stuff of Thought, Language as a Window into Human Nature. Um, Stephen Pinker is a rather prolific author, and I've read at least one of other of his books, which is called The Blank Slate, which dealt with the, the myth that humans are born as blank slates. Um, and then, you know, for whatever particular philosophy that people believe, that is then imprinted upon us as we develop. Um, it was very good, very thought-provoking. And when I stumbled upon this at a uh, community yard sale for 50 cents, I grabbed it. Now, the last book I read dealt with quantum mechanics and cosmology. It was very thought-provoking. It was a difficult read. So I picked this up, and I thought to myself, Oh, good, a book on language. It will be a nice break. That was a mistake. This book was not a break. This book was far more work than the book that dealt with quantum mechanics and cosmology, because this book is challenging. Now, part of it is my own personal quirks. I have never been able to comprehend the structure of the English language well. You could ask me what an adverb is, and I'm not going to be able to tell you. It doesn't matter how many times I've read the definition, it doesn't stick. So when Mr. Pinker starts talking about um, transitive and uh, verbs, I'm just like, all righty, and it, things just started to slide over my mind. So I definitely slowed down and really tried to dig into the text. And I admit that I probably missed 20% of what this book had to say. But what I did get was fascinating. Mr. Pinker deals with how our language handles specific topics, and, he, and he's building on them as he goes through the book, like how we talk, talk, discuss location and distance and movement, how we discuss units of measurement and time. In a, a, for simple things like you say applesauce regardless of the quantity of applesauce. Now that seems simple, but it's different than other things. For example, you say gravel but you don't say gravel to refer to a piece of gravel, you say pebble. That, that very subtle cognitive difference has profound implications on how people learn language and how we apply a rough set of group of rules to new encounters with new words. For example, they did numerous studies in this book dealing with small children because children are just being in the process of learning the language. And one of them they did is that they played, they took a bell and they rang it three times and they said, that's a lot of FEPs. Can you show me what a FEP is? And the kid rang the bell once because the kid had properly inferred that FEPs meant multiples of something. Then they went to another kid and they, they rang a bell three times and said, that's a FEP. Can you play a FEP for me? And the kid automatically played three because he had been taught that FEP refers to a group. Now, the, the book covers all kinds of studies like that, far more complex ones than that, but kids are used a lot. Um, again, because they are in the process of developing language skills. Uh, they did a study where they discovered that a 10-month-old baby cannot tell the difference between two different toys, but a 12-month-old 12 12 -month baby can and will be confused if you play a trick on them and they are expecting to see this toy and they get this one instead. And that primates have the same development, not at the same time. So a younger primate will not be fooled because they don't can't tell a difference, but a slightly older primate will be confused because they can tell the difference. Um, he talks about an entire chapter dedicated to cursing and swearing, which was very entertaining. Um, it's just an incredibly complex, deep book dealing with language and um, sociolinguistics, uh, cognitive behavior, um, the, the structure of how arguments are framed, how we handle things like bribery and innuendo. For example, if you were to tell a cop who pulled you over for a ticket, I will give you $50 if you make this go away. 
half the time you may get lucky, and half the time you're going to go to jail. But if you say, it'd be really good if we could take care of this right here and now, or something even more subtle than that. By making it an innuendo, by making it, you know, something that, that it's circumspect, you have a better chance of pulling in the dishonest cop and avoiding being arrested by the honest cop. And they also did a study of dealing with maitre d's. Now the classic is if you give a maitre d a hundred bucks, he'll bump up, he'll bump you up on the on the uh, waiting list for a table. All right, it's in every film, every novel, it's everywhere. It's a joke. It's been going on for a hundred years. So a reporter went out and tried and tried it. And he uses things like, you wouldn't happen to have a cancellation today, or something like that, you know, vague. And then he would offer them, offer them a C-note. Now he did this dozens of times, including one place that had a reservations going out six months. And while he didn't get his table that day, he got a phone call four days later that bumped him up ahead of 2,700 guests, potential customers, because he slipped a $100 bill to the major D. Now, the really interesting thing is, how many of the maitre d's do you think could be bribed? Did you guess? All of them. Every single maitre d' accepted the bribe. And later, the reporter contacted the restaurants and uh, asked about this, and they said, and the people that owned them said, well, our restaurant doesn't do that, or if we found out a maitre d' was doing that, we'd fire them. So people knew it was going on, everyone knows it's going on, but they need to play this game with language. They need to play this game with saving face. And this book deals with that. And the whole chapter on saving face and, and how we play games, like you don't walk up to a woman in a bar and say, I'd like to have sex with you. You play the game. You open up with conversation. The goal, of course, and everybody involved in knows this, is that you're looking to get laid. But nobody comes out and directly and says it. Now, I actually know someone who did that. He would co walk up and said, hey, you want to? And 99% of the time, he would get a walk away or a slap or something like that. But for him, it didn't matter. Because every once in a while, he'd get laid. And for the amount of effort he had to put into it, he was happy. Actually, it may have been even a better percentage of that. It may have been like 90 or 95% of the time it failed, and 10 or 5, 5 or 10% of the time it worked. And he was an ugly guy. But this was a fascinating book. I highly recommend anything written by Steven Pinker. Um, if you have a fascination for language, if you have a fascination for how people arrive at the thoughts they have, how we develop language over time, why our languages have similar structures even though the languages themselves are very different and why different languages and different languages associated with different cultures have different structures for example our language has lots of structure for for numbers because numbers are very important to to americans and to western world but there's a south american tribe that has a structure for language that is one two bunches that's it. One too many. Because that's all they need. A hunter who may have a dozen arrows, but he knows each arrow individually. So he doesn't have to think of them as a dozen. They're 12 individual arrows, and he knows each of them as an individual arrow. So there is no need for him to count them in a group higher than one. That's fascinating. And this book is equally fascinating. So again, if you like language, you like good writing, you like things that are going to be thought-provoking and really make you dig in, dig in and work, read Steven Pinker's The Stuff of Thought.